uh, let's get to the big meat of uh, of of what I want to talk about today, which is the first two days of the uh, Chauvin trial, and uh, basically basically everything that is wrong with it. Right? Uh, not in the sense of like he shouldn't be having a trial. I mean, I I I think he should already be imprisoned because there is a a uh, plethora of evidence showing that he is a murderer and he has a record of doing it there. He's, he's killed at least five people before George Floyd. Um, uh, he's had, uh, uh, various, um, uh, accounts of violence, uh, unjustified violence that has been swept under the rug by the Minneapolis police department by people like Amy Klobuchar. Right. We, we talked about that a couple weeks ago. This dude is bad. This dude is objectively a horrible person and should not be involved in any job that uh, that 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 has any sort of law enforcement uh, uh, involved in it at all. And he should also not be uh, <laughs> have a job that involves a gun um, because he has proved that he cannot be responsible with a firearm he's he shot several people uh he should also not have a job where he is in direct contact with the public uh so so that that kind of restricts what he can and can't do beyond just being a murderous police officer and i get it right the right to a fair trial and all that but hey do do people of color in this country get the right to a fair trial or do people just automatically insinuate that the most innocent of black people are really thugs and criminals? Hmm. Gee, I wonder, uh, but wonder no longer because that the answer to that statement is no, they don't get, <laughs> they, they don't get to prove, uh, guilt, right? Uh, they, they are, they are not seen as innocent until proven guilty. They are seen guilty until proven innocent. And in this case, uh, they're arguing that Derek Chauvin is innocent when he is clearly not. And there's a lot of evidence showing that he murdered George Floyd. And and I, I was I was watching uh, some of the day three trial, uh, and I'm not going to go into the details of that because we're not done with day three, day three obviously. Um, and I'll probably cover that uh, again next week. I will kind of go through what the rest of this week has so I can do a little bit more of a comprehensive coverage of it rather than um yeah rather rather than uh kind of go about it day by day uh i don't i don't know if we're going to get a whole lot i mean i have 2 days worth of stuff here and i think that th there's enough here to go through but if i go through it day by day i i don't know if i would have um enough to kind of put pieces together uh so let's start with the opening statement the the prosecution basically addressed how over-the-top Chauvin's actions were. Um, and they also argued how this wasn't a difficult split-second decision, right? That's what you always hear. Well, oh, Chris, you don't understand policing. It's such a tough job. It's so stressful. It's so strenuous. You don't know the split-second decisions that they have to make. It could be life or death. And this was not life or death. I watched the whole video, you guys, top to fucking bottom. Top to fucking bottom, I watched uh, the the the. I think the there was one or two body cam footages that that came out. I watched the street cam videos. I watched the videos that other people took that that got spread around. I watched fucking all of them, and in no, there there's absolutely no fucking evidence that George Floyd was resisting arrest. None whatsoever. Zero. He was complying with them. In a lot of cases, he was kind of pleading with them to just kind of go easy on him. Uh, but, you know, it, it, and I don't know if they'll bring this up in the trial either, is the Derek Chauvin worked with George Floyd at the at a nightclub where he was a bouncer. And he told the boss of that, the owner of that nightclub, that he had a problem with the people that he worked with. And pr primarily all the people that he worked with were black. So, you know, that that might be a little bit difficult to to prove and, and bring into court for, uh, you know, for first degree charge. But I mean, he sat on his neck for eight minutes and I mean, we'll go through it and I can point out where I think the first degree murder charge should be applied to. But right now it's second degree murder, second degree manslaughter and third degree murder as well. Uh, 
in the video too, the in the opening statements, it, it gets pointed point pointed out uh, uh, that uh, Floyd said, "I can't breathe," twenty seven times as Chauvin continued his aggression. Twenty seven times, a man says twenty seven times that he can't breathe, and Chauvin, being the sociopath and psychopath that he is, um. continues to apply more pressure to his neck and, you know, adjust himself and get comfortable uh, with killing this man. The defense, their opening statement, pins the death on a pre-existing condition in drug use. Uh, you know, uh, and, and I mean, that makes sense, right? The pre-existing condition of of being a black man in america where randomly out of the blue without any kind of warning this is just a pre-existing condition of being black in america a 200 pound police officer will just show up and on your neck oh man what a crazy pre-existing condition this is right then he goes on to say oh he's got he's got heart medication that he takes and his his heart just couldn't couldn't take the adrenaline from all the drugs he was taking and and the medication you know it had side effects and those side effects could have caused uh, could have caused death well maybe if then the pharmaceutical company should be involved in that as well right is is the defense calling the pharmaceutical company and and putting the death on them for saying hey did you know that your heart medication causes death which is the opposite of what medication should do are you aware of that? The drugs they claim are in his system were meth and fentanyl, which I looked this up. If you combine those two, uh, you have a you have a very high likelihood of overdosing immediately, right? So you don't get to enjoy whatever that high is like. Which, uh, from what I've read on, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I personally am not going to use fentanyl or meth. Uh, those are not drugs that I'm interested in at all. Um, but from from what I've read, uh, fentanyl, you know, it can give you, it doesn't give you euphoria. It seems like it just kind of knocks you out and can eventually render you unconscious. Uh, whereas meth gives you the euphoria and the, it's an upper. So it kind of gives you the euphoria and you get to do all the crazy things that you want to do. Um, so for them to say that he OD'd doesn't make sense because when you mix those two drugs together, the OD happens rather quickly. And I don't know if you've seen somebody OD uh, or seen movies where people OD they don't just kind of fade away, right? It's it's usually when people OD on opiates uh, or on, on methamphetamines, like their body has a visceral reaction and, and they kind of spit stuff up. And I don't know, I can't remember if this, is, if this was debunked or not, but didn't, didn't this whole drug thing get debunked? Um, like, like they're like th these weren't the drugs that they found in a system. They kind of just said, "Oh, he looked jacked up and high." Oh my god. Uh, I'm not. I, I, if you guys know, leave a comment. I'm, I'm, I'm honestly not sure if the drug thing was debunked by doctors or not. Um, but uh, he said the officers were distressed. The officers were in a state of distress because of this guy, right? And even that statement in and of itself plays into that racist stereotype of, oh, man, those big, black, scary dudes, right? Oh, the black man is sure is scary. You never know. You never know when they could just rage out and start hulking through the city, causing major property destruction and coming for your wives and sisters and daughters. They were distressed because that's what happens with black people. So they're using racism as a defense, racist stereotypes as a defense. Um, here's the other thing. In those videos, none of the officers appear to be distressed. Officer Tao, it was aggressively pushing fucking bystanders back that were, you know, videotaping and telling Chauvin to get off, 
Floyd's neck, who was handcuffed and laying on the ground, who was not resisting arrest. The only reason why they thought he was resisting arrest is because he Floyd was adjusting because there's a man on his neck and he's trying to adjust to get to a point where he can breathe again. If a man trying to adjust so he can breathe and continue living causes you di distress, you've automatically proven yourself to be a psychopath and a sociopath not fit to be in our society. And definitely not fit to have a badge and a gun patrolling the streets. They smiled. They make remarks. I believe uh, a Tao was like, this is why you don't do drugs, kids. Dare program. I was a dare officer. As he's shoving people around. They also downplay Chauvin's uh, history of violence. Like I said, he, he has minimally killed at least five people before George Floyd, injured several others, fired weapons uh, at unarmed civilians, downplayed that whole thing. I want to make a note of that because that's important. That shows that he has a history of this stuff. He has a history of targeting innocent civilians. That means that he's not stable. It also means that he's too dangerous to be out on the streets in a uniform with a badge and a gun. And unless they're going to restrict him from getting a gun, we can't really trust this person to be out in, this, uh, out in our streets, can we? That's what Biden says. There's, a, there's that speech from the crime bill. Oh, I don't care. I don't care why people commit crimes. They all need to be taken off the street because they might be coming to fight your mom and punch your dad and suck off your brother. I don't, I don't fucking know. He, he just went off on a fucking Joe Biden rant. Well, Chauvin, Chauvin is exactly who Joe Biden is talking about. He is the unstable person that you don't know what they're going to do. But that guy gets to be a cop because he's white. The whole video, again, top to bottom, shows that George Floyd wasn't resisting arrest. Okay? Shows that he wasn't resisting arrest. That was a fabrication. And the people that believe that just out themselves to be passive racists. Right, they out themselves to be. They they might not come out and say racist things, but they think it, and they and they subvertly act on it. To so the people that sit there and go, "Oh, that does make sense," you know, he did look like I saw. I saw a little shoulder move. I saw one of the oh oh that's resisting, right? That's oh that's scary. I could see it. I could see it. Yeah, you just proved yourself to be a passive racist, and you should probably check your biases. So let's talk about some of these witnesses that they that they pulled up, right? There was a 911 dispatcher. Um uh, and she and she said that she could see through the street cams that this that she was witnessing excessive force from Derek Chauvin on George Floyd. And she couldn't understand what was what would what would possess a police officer to use this much force, right? She just couldn't get it. The defense tries to discredit the 911 dispatcher by saying, well, you're not a cop, are you? You're not a police officer. So so how dare you make a judgment that somebody putting their knee on somebody's neck is excessive force? Maybe it was the force that was necessary. You don't know, do you? Because you're just a 911 dispatcher. He might as well just have ended that with "you fucking piece of shit." You're just a piece of shit nine one one dispatcher. Like I've, that, he might this, this fucking DA might as well have ended that that line of questioning with that, because that's the attitude that he had towards her. The implication being that if you're not a police officer, you can't judge the police. You can't police the police, right? The only people that are allowed to police the police are the police. But the police are never going to do that. There's a weird fucking brotherhood 
That's why there's very few whistleblowers from inside police departments. These people justify killer cops. This is the next big one that happened on day one. Uh, a gentleman by the name of Donald Williams, who was one of the people that uh, took the photo. I believe he's the one that called uh, Tao, Officer Tao. Uh, he he kept saying, oh, you're a tough guy now, right? You're a real man. You, you ain't nothing but a bum. You ain't nothing but a bum. Like, if you saw that video and you saw the dude saying that, uh, that's who uh, Donald Williams is. And he said, you know, he's taking MMA classes and stuff like that before uh, martial arts. And he basically said, well, this guy was using a blood choke, which is a maneuver that they teach you in MMA to knock out your opponent, to render them unconscious. And he made he made eye contact with Chauvin as an and, and he acknowledged like when he said, yo, that's a blood choke. Chauvin looked up and made eye contact with him, uh, which to Donald Williams was a confirmation that it was the blood choke. And that's the photo that we see. That confirmation look is the photo that we see, that infamous photo of Derek Chauvin staring at the camera while he's sitting on top of George Floyd's neck. He also said that when the ambulance finally got there and and then later was allowed to get Floyd's body, that Floyd's body was limp at that point. And then he called 911 because he had uh, witnessed a crime. And the defense goes, oh, so you called the police on the police? Why would you do that? And he goes, yeah, because I witnessed a crime. I witnessed a man getting murdered. That's I, I called the cops because that's what you're supposed to do. The police are are not supposed to be Steven Seagal above the law. They're part of the law that they represent. Now, the defense then goes on to say, well, you distracted the police officers from doing their job. Maybe Chauvin would have gotten up had he not been so distracted. Yes. Oh, the people filming you murdering a man. Oh, man, I'm so distracted. By me sitting on this man's neck, I'm all, I gotta, I gotta fucking double down on it now because of all these distractions. I gotta really focus on killing this dude. Maybe if he wouldn't have been distracted, he would have just been like, "Ah, oh, no one is paying attention to me. I should just leave." If I don't have witnesses to me killing somebody, he, I would just leave. What, what fucking kind of defense is that shit? And then he does this. He paints him as angry. He paints Donald uh, Donald Williams as angry, right? Oh, you're just... And, and then he kind of uses that racist um, stereotype of the angry black man. Well, we can't trust you because you're angry. You're just, a, you're just a typical angry black man, Donald Williams. That's what uh, the defense uses. And, and like we uh, talked about the other day, this is a classic defense. They use racial stereotypes as a way to sway the jury. By painting black people as angry, by, by by painting black people as criminals and thugs and drug addicts. They use these racial stereotypes to try to sway a jury. And Williams pushes back and says he was maintaining professional composure which he was and the defense tried to use the whole oh well you called um you called uh officer Tao a bum how is that angry he wasn't screaming it he wasn't going up to his face and none of that was happening he called him a bum that's what you're what? That's what you're denoting. Boy, this DA, I believe his name is Eric Nelson, is so privileged that he hasn't ever seen true anger in his life. What a wonderfully sheltered life you must have lived. 
this for all circumstance for all things considered during the circumstance Donald Williams held phenomenal composure. Had he gotten emotional and angry, that ang anger would have been justified and validated. All right, I'm going to look at your comments real quick. Uh, Holly says the defense is smearing George Floyd. The question is, did the knee to the neck kill? Defense claims there was underlying heart condition. If I had a knee on my neck, I might be a little anxious. Exactly. Yeah. Um, if if your heart rate is going to go up, it's going to go up, particularly because you're not taking regular breaths. You're not taking deep breaths. You're taking shallow breaths. You're taking infrequent breaths. So your heart has to pump a lot harder to get the blood flow going. Um, you know, and look, I'm a fucking jag off idiot comedian, uh, and I can figure this shit out. So for a, a very wealthy and sociopathically intelligent defense attorney like Eric Nelson, he should have no problem figuring that out. But again, this is gaslighting. He's gaslighting every witness. He's gaslighting uh, the jury by by twisting the facts, by bending what reality is, and claiming something is that it's not. Uh, Holly says there were complaints against Chauvin, and Amy Klobuchar said and did nothing. She had the nerve to go to the memorial. Yeah, I remember you mentioning that, too, the last time. We talked about it. He has a huge, huge record. And Klobuchar, when she was the, when she was the DA, uh, dropped the charge, ignored the charges. There were there was, I mean, I think he got like paid time off for two weeks. Like he got two weeks paid time off, right? Which only validates and justifies someone like Derek Chauvin to continue doing what he's doing. Um, so you know, it, 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 Amy Klobuchar bears responsibility for George Floyd's death because it could have been prevented had she done something about this back in 2011. Uh, Shane, good to see you. Uh, Shane says Chauvin should be in prison. Uh, agreed. Uh, and I think that when they worked at the same club needs to be looked into a little bit better. It does, and I agree with you on that because I think it, I, I think if they do an investigation, from from what I understand and from what a couple people have told me, it's a lot harder to prove first degree murder in this circumstance, and bringing that uh, is 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 kind of a risky maneuver because it can it can either really help the case or it can really derail the case. So the prosecution might not be for uh, willing to take that big of a risk in this situation. Um, from witness accounts, from the videotape, from his past record, it should be enough for a jury to say that this dude murdered him. Uh, what what the defense is really hanging up on is gaslighting the witnesses and really pushing that drug narrative, uh, which, again, I'm pretty sure was debunked. Like, I don't think they found drugs in his system uh, or or at least drugs that would cause a cardiac arrest. Uh and what could cause a cardiac arrest is um, fear. He said, I can't breathe 27 times. You don't think he was terrified of losing his life? There were a couple of witnesses that said that they watched him accept his own death and realize that he's going to die here. You don't think that could trigger something? And why would he, why would he why would that if it if, if, let's say hypothetically it is cardiac arrest caused by fear well what caused that fear could it be the two hundred pound man on his neck that's stopping airflow to his lungs could it be the massively racist criminal justice system that sees people like George Floyd as a threat when they're not. Even even that cardiac arrest argument can be made that it was caused by Derek Chauvin's aggression, which would then make Derek Chauvin guilty of murder, which would put him in the second degree murder charge. 
Holly says, yeah, uh, screaming, get your knee off his neck is really distracting. Yeah, it's, it's hard. You know, it's hard to concentrate on killing somebody when everybody else is like, hey, stop doing that. It's like, oh, my God, guys. Derek Chauvin can't get an erection unless he sees the life come out of somebody's life. So come on, you're getting in the way of that, guys. Have some consideration, would you? Uh, Chauvin has 12 lawyers and a million dollar fund. Yeah, again, everybody that contributed to that million dollar fund, racist. There's, I mean, there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Sarah M. Jenkins, good to see you over on the Rockfins. Uh, and as I mentioned, please, you guys over at Rockfin should leave comments as well. And at the end of uh, the segments, I will I will take a look at them. Um, OK, so I want to move to I believe this is day two. This is when more of the emotional um, testimonies come into play here. Uh, there's an 18 year old uh, last name, Frazier. I'm going to just keep it to that. There's other articles that used her first name, but I'm 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 gonna I'm gonna keep it at uh, uh, at her last name here. Uh, the only violence she witnessed was from the police. And I was watching an NBC playback, and they talked about so this girl feels guilty, right? Because she didn't she she didn't do anything to stop the cops from um, killing George Floyd, and she feels guilty about it. What sucks? Because here, here, here's here's the side of of police violence you don't see is is the people that are trying to fucking help uh, and, and stop police violence. Right. Uh, these are people that are uh, taking the example of the cop watch by the Black Panthers, and they're using modern technology to get the word out there about police violence, about police brutality. Right. Um what what the Panthers did back in the 60s, we're, we're seeing done today. But instead of having guns strapped around us and w watching the cops from a safe distance, uh, we've got cell phones. That we're filming the cops. And um, that's that's just a carryover. She feels guilty that she wasn't able to do that. And that sucks. She shouldn't because that's a difficult position. Uh what if the cops decide that they're going to open fire on the crowd? Not unlikely. We've seen that happen. Countless times. What if they decide that they're, oh, we're being threatened by cameras. So we have to escalate and take out our, our incendiary weapons that fire a projectile at a thousand meters per second. Those photons could kill us, you guys. NBC, when they did the coverage of this, replayed the very emotional testimony of, of Ms. Frazier here, uh, talking about her guilt. And I, and I sincerely hope that she has a good support network around her um, and that she can get, you know, uh, mental health services. I, I I really do hope that. Really, the Minneapolis Police Department should be paying for her mental health services. Everybody that's kind of involved in this trial is owed something by the Minneapolis Police Department. Because if you're if you are going to say that the Minneapolis Police Department is there to protect and serve the community, well, you you did fuck all for that, and now you owe the people of the community a fucking answer. She said the only violence that she saw was from the police and NBC refused to cover that part of it. Don't you think that's important to note in a case like this? In a case where where the innocent black man is being smeared as a violent criminal, a violent drug addled criminal. You don't think that it's important to cover the fact that Lester Holt, Lester Holt, who's a black dude himself, didn't fucking cover this. The only violence this person witnessed was from the fucking police. 
and Lester Holt thinks that's not important to cover. Frazier's cousin, who she was with at the time, going into cup noodles, said the ambulance had to push Chauvin off Floyd. That's how determined Derek Chauvin was to stay on top of this man's neck to ensure that his life would be extinguished that day. That the that that the ambulance, the people in the ambulance, the paramedics had to fucking push this dude off his neck. That is a point where you can say that this was you can you can make the claim that this was first degree. Mix that with the acknowledgement that he's doing a blood choke. You can say that he had every, every plan to fucking kill George Floyd. That he knew that what he was doing was going to kill him. And that was the intent of Derek Chauvin's answer, Derek Chauvin's uh, actions. So we'll go to uh, Funari and Eldridge, who are the two two other women that they talked to. And, you know, they also filmed. They I think they were across the street or something. And the defense, again, tries to paint them as angry black women. Oh, but you guys are just angry following mob rule. Oh, you know what happens when black people get together? They're crazy and they get angry. Again, using using racism as a defense. Right. You want to know why racism is so widely accepted in America? You want to know why people turn a blind eye to racism? Because you have defense attorneys using it as a point of defense to gaslight the jury, to manipulate the jury and to gaslight the witnesses themselves. But you guys were angry following mob rule. They said that they pointed out that that Floyd went unconscious, that they saw his eyes roll back in the back of his head and he passed out. This is a quote. I was upset because there was nothing we could do except watch them take a life in front of our eyes. That quote describes America's power structure. And why we need to keep organizing and protesting and pushing back against these sort of things. Uh, why when uh, the murder of Breonna Taylor gets a, a fucking misdemeanor charge for shooting a door on accident. You missed your target. The target was the black person, you fucking dolt. You, ki you, you shot a door five years. When that's the only sentencing you get. We have every right to be pissed and upset. And we take to the streets. Direct action changes legislation. Not trying to fucking push Joe Biden to the left. Not trying to elect more progressives into Congress. No, no, no. They're all shitbags. And if they don't start out as shitbags, they will become shitbags. Because that's what the fucking American political machine does. It's a capitalist system which means that it runs on inequality and slavery and torment, which means that the, the legislators of this capitalist system will legislate on behalf of inequality, torture, and slavery. The only way we can fucking sh shift the balance of power is if we all start doing our part to amplify these voices to start going out in the streets and protesting, to amplify the narrative of what the protest is really about. A lot more of us than, they, than there are of them. But that one statement, we were watching them take somebody's life and we couldn't do anything about it. That one statement describes America's power structure more than any other statement. That's why we need to be in solidarity with each other. It needs to happen. They talked to a, a, a firefighter, an EMT named Hansen, uh, and she basically said the cops wouldn't let her do her job. 
They wouldn't let they, they wouldn't let her come and check George Floyd. They wouldn't let her come and uh, uh, check his vitals and administer medical help to him. Uh, she says there was a man being killed, human that was denied the right of medical treatment. They denied him the right of medical treatment. Again, knowingly killing this man. That's a first degree murder charge. I didn't know he was going to. Yeah. What do you think happens when there's a there's 200 pounds of pressure and force on somebody's fucking windpipe? You didn't know that this person was going to die. You used a blood choke on him. People on the street are telling you 27 times he said, I can't breathe. And then the person that might have been able to revive him, you prevented her from doing her job. You prevented him from having the right to live. Where are the fucking pro-life people on this? Ain't no pro-lifers talking about police brutality. Only precious when it's in the womb. Once it comes out, it can go fuck itself. She then watched them take his pulse and ignore his death. She also described Derek Chauvin as very comfortable sitting on George Floyd's neck. Again, that level shows you that this was premeditated. Maybe it wasn't months of planning, but in that moment, he knew that he could fucking get rid of George Floyd's life. All of it, the blood choke, the the not letting the EMT do her job. The only violence that they saw was from the cops. The, and then and then when the ambulance arrived, the paramedics had to shove Chauvin off of George. All of this shows premeditation. This guy knew that his action would lead to his death, or at least he would render himself unconscious and maybe get maybe become partially brain dead or something. But this guy knew that this was going to happen. So this is where things get left off here. They The defense started arguing with uh, with Hanson, right? They got into a, a back and forth argument. Let me see if I can find the exact... Uh, argument here okay so this is what this is what this article says here i'll pull it up for you guys this is from the world socialist website here here's what this says while under cross-examination nelson asked hansen if the crowd of bystanders was angry and upset upset expanding on his earlier narrative that the crowd was threatening to the officers Hansen became visibly upset and replied, I don't know if you've seen anybody killed, but it's upsetting. Uh, Nelson tried to poke holes uh, in, in her testimony, drawing on her own experiences as a firefighter to suggest that she could have assumed that the police had already called for medical assistance because it was protocol. He also scrutinized Hansen's statement that she gave no investigators... Uh, uh, she. He also scrutinized Hansen's statement that she gave to investigators after Floyd's death, leading to an argument breaking out between the pair. Um, so the, again, the defense gaslit, you know, oh, you could have just assumed. Oh, were they getting upset and angry? You've never seen anybody die in front of you, right? Because that's a pretty fucked up thing to witness. All of those people are going to need mental health services to deal with that level of trauma. But yeah, no, let's focus on the fact that they got angry and upset at a, 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 a black man dying and paint them racistly as an angry mob of black people that were threatening the officers with fucking cell phone cameras telling him to get the fuck off of a person's neck. That's not threatening. That's telling you to do something humane, you fucking mangy fuck. This this is all gaslighting. This is all gaslighting. 
I've seen gaslighting up firsthand. I've been gaslit. Uh, I was gaslit for a long time by someone that I thought cared about me. So I know what it looks like. I can see this happening. The reason why they're getting upset and angry is because that's the exact point of what the defense is doing. The defense is um, uh, what's the what's the word here? Is is coaxing this emotion out of them? Is is poking at them to 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 make them upset so they can say, "Oh, this emotion is irrational. They can't be. None of their testimony can be taken seriously." And if you're if you're a decent judge, if you're a decent judge on this case, then you can see what the defense is doing. You can see that it's gaslighting them. You can see that they're gaslighting not just the witnesses but also the fucking jury. And you should fucking throw this guy out of court. Because Eric Nelson, who's the fucking DA that's defending uh, Derek Chauvin, is a serial fucking gaslighter. Every single one, he's done that to. Every single witness, he, he's, he, he, and I bet you it'll continue throughout the rest of this case. Day in and day out, what we will see is the cross-examination being a series of gaslighting, using racism, using false facts, and bending the truth. That's what this fucking case is going to become. Chauvin, by definition, is a psychopath and a sociopath. He showed virtually no emotion. The only time he showed emotion was when he was excited that someone recognized what he was doing to George Floyd. He has numerous accounts of murder and violence. Numerous accounts. That means he's pathological. He's pathological in needing to hurt people. And being a cop gave him that avenue. It gave him a release to essentially being a legal serial killer. That's what he is. He's a legal serial killer. And there's probably a bunch of other cops that fit that bill too. So Judge Cahill should recognize that the defense attorney, Eric Nelson, is a fucking gaslighter. And he's specifically using, uh, is trying to bait emotional responses in a very emotional case. And where are we in our legal system if we can't have any sort of emotion while we're on the stand? These are all victims of some kind of trauma. If they want to express some emotion, they should goddamn be allowed to do it. If they throw any of these witnesses' testimonies out because they got emotional, because this asshole keeps trying to paint all black people as angry and upset, because that's what black people do. They get angry and upset. Oh, scary, angry black people. If that's what if, if racism is the defense that they're going to fucking use and this judge accepts that and throws a bunch of evidence out because of emotionality and because they were angry and upset while watching a man fucking get killed. Then this judge should be removed from this case. Because clearly this judge does not understand how witnessing someone dying affects someone's mental health. Let's take a breath. <laughs> uh, Shane, uh, it's, a, it's a Malcolm X quote. The media is uh, the most powerful entity on earth. They have a power to make the innocent guilty and make the guilty innocent. And that's power because they control the minds of the masses. Yeah, uh, there's a lot of people. I mean, people that I would consider to be very loving, generous and empathetic people that came out of the woodwork when I started talking about George Floyd and uh, what was going on in Minneapolis and stuff. When I started talking about this, that used some of these narratives. Well, wasn't he on drugs? Oh, well, it was a counterfeit bill. What did you expect? That yeah, counterfeit bill means that somebody should get publicly executed on the side of the street. The justifications become illogical. Uh, Holly says this summer will be interesting. I agree. We'll we'll see what happens. I think I think a lot of the protests are gonna come back. Um, yeah, I think I think you're gonna see you're gonna see uh, a revival of some of these protests across the city. Um, 
Shane, uh, strange how they put up those metal barriers in the city. It's almost like they know that Chauvin will get away with this and want people for, to be prepared for the backlash. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I said that from the start. You can, you can tell how a case is going to go based on the, the protections that the cities are going to end up taking. Um, we saw this with Louisville, right? They, they, the day that they, they knew the grand jury's sentencing was going to be released, the National Guard gets sent to Louisville. And then after that, when there was a protest, they kettled the protesters and arrested them for protesting. And then you had the DA that basically came out, uh, the black DA in, in Louisville, who basically Uncle Tommed everybody in the city of Louisville, that said that what happened to Breonna Taylor was basically justified. So they know. Kenosha was no different. Um, uh, when Tamir Rice was the, the, the sentencing of Tamir Rice's killer was, was about to be released. It was no different. And really who escalates the violence in these protests are not the protesters, they're cops and those like undercover people. I mean, I, I watched that happen in Pittsburgh. I watched that happen in Pittsburgh. So, you know, I, I'm I'm 100% sure they know. I'm 100% sure they know. She says, in the cult of capitalism, $20 is worth a life. Yeah, no kidding, right? No kidding. Thank you so much for checking out this video. If you enjoyed this content, uh, please make sure that you hit the like button hit the share button, and make sure you're subscribed to my channel, whether it's on Rockfin, YouTube, or Facebook. Especially Facebook and YouTube, they often uncensor pe uh, un unsubscribe people and they censor this content. So if you want to keep up to date, make sure you're subscribed. Hit that bell button so you get notifications of when I'm putting up new videos and when I am going live. I usually go live uh, on uh, Fridays and on Mondays. Uh, and if you want more information about a, a bunch of the other stuff that I do, uh, whether it's my Forkful of Noodles podcast, the Taboo Table Talk interview podcast, or the Road Reflections live streams, uh, make sure you go to my website, krishmohanhaha.com. It's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A.com. There you'll find past episodes of uh, of various shows that I uh, that I do, as well as information about when I'll be performing live virtual comedy shows, the Forkful of Noodles live virtual comedy shows. Uh, the dates and tickets will be available directly on my website. But if you're also on financial stable ground, you can help contribute to the show financially by making a one-time donation or becoming a sustaining member, which gets you free tickets and bonus content. You can go to krishmohanhaha.com slash donate to, to make any kind of financial contributions. But if you can't, it's not a necessity. Most of my stuff is available for free and for everybody to enjoy. So again, go to krishmohanhaha.com. It's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A. -H -H -A, and I hope to see you at the next video.